Hello there guys, it's Joey. So today's video is going to be talking about uh, the Valkyrie. The Valkyrie as an interesting crossover between Nordic mythology and Celtic mythology, as well as lessons under the Valkyrie, which is to do with identity, interestingly enough. And we're going to get into all of that in a little minute, I'm just going to uh, just say first and foremost, apologies for there not being many videos at the moment. Everything is really crazy busy right now. And videos uh, for YouTube are kind of like the, the last thing to get done. And uh, the reason for this is many fold. YouTube is on a sliding scale of what they keep doing to creators isn't great. And uh, they keep like messing around with what you know, if people use certain words, it's getting very restrictive. A lot of people are looking at Twitch, are looking at different platforms, and I've got to say that's in the fraw of my mind right now um, to move away from uh, what is becoming a, a dying platform, I think. It's unfortunate, um, but there we go. The content is still available in many other places, and... Uh, it, I'm not going to stop YouTube until we get to the point where it's uh, they're basically looking at words like pagan and stopping people talking about things, which may happen given the unfortunateness of how YouTube has been going lately. Anyway, this is a requested video. There are requested items at the end of the video, but we're going to be having a whole long talk about some mythology, about some poetry, about some themes, and about spiritual personal gnosis with the energies of the Valkyrie. So it was interesting to me initially when I was asked uh, to conduit and work with Valkyrie energy, and I was not sure what I was going to get. Uh, I think we all kind of expect the kind, it's, it's kind of the She-Ra Valkyrie image. And it's, you know, the, the, the blonde hair and the big white wings and then the like metal helmets. And there was something very off about this perception to me. And it meant that at first I was like, how am I going to connect with this? Because there's something off about this so for some reason. I don't feel that there's like a spiritual pool to delve into here. And I'm not sure why. And what it ended up being is that the Valkyrie energy didn't come into this like that kind of thing at all. They actually were supplying me initially with kind of like this really interesting poetry, which was not typical. Um, it was very much like many voices and so what uh, many voices and speaking different lines I'm going to read that to you now um, as best I can because it was quite uh, multi-layered so it wasn't necessarily that the lines followed one another it was maybe in a conversation maybe threads of a song <sighs> singing to the lost that's the thing I am not a shining beacon I do not guide Thudding of blackened wings foretelling death, blood weaving entrails, blood soaked prophetic weaving. What entails within those entrails? A savage love. You would demote us, sanitize us, saw down our vicious edges. Battle stance to nothing, a lover's grip? Question mark. We are befallen. We are fate and death. We are the bone jaw snapping closed, a heavy gurgle of man's last utterance. Nothing so fragile, wingless, you'd make us, break us, torment us. We are befallen, we are fate and death. And I was like, huh? Because I was like, this sounds like a bathe energy. This sounds like a, a battle crow death energy and so I was that's the first thing that I got before I'd had a look at any of the mythology before I'd had a, like a delve beyond the presentation of Valkyries as they usually get presented and that was really interesting to me because I was like this energy is this energy is completely not what is expected from Valkyrie. It's completely off the chart. It's not 
stereotypical warrior ch- leading the chosen dead away. So I had a look uh, for some mythology and I found some very interesting poetry and some of the most interesting poetry is where it bleeds into Celtic mythology. So I'm going to read to you uh, from, let me get the correct title, because I wrote the title down, The Battle of Clontaf, Clontaf uh, 1014, which is set in Ireland. Vikings invading Ireland. So blood rains from the cloudy web on the broad loom of slaughter. The web of man grey as armour is now being woven. The Valkyries will cross it with a crimson weft. Lands will be ruled by new peoples who once inhabited outlying headlands. We pronounce a great king destined to die. Now an earl is felled by spears. The men of Ireland will suffer a grief that will never grow old in the minds of men. The web is now woven and the battlefields reddened. The news of disaster will spread through the lands. It is horrible now to look around as a blood-red cloud darkens the sky. The heavens are stained with the blood of men as the Valkyries sing their song. We sang while victory songs from the young king hail to our singing. Let him who listens to our Valkyrie song, learn it well and tell it to others. Um, There was a little bit more in different, I'm wondering if it's different interpretations because I have a slightly different one written down with slightly uh, more aggressive language, if if you can imagine. the warp is made of human entrails, human heads are used as heddle weights, the heddle rods and blood wet spears, the shafts are iron bound and arrows are shuttles. With swords we will weave this web of battle, the Valkyries go weaving with drawn swords, Hild, and now I'm going to butcher the names, I apologise, Hild and Hjothrimmel and Sengrid and Svigel. Spears will shatter shields, will splinter swords, will gnaw like wolves through armor. And it, it's, it's so aggressive. It's really not kind of like female angelic figures leading chosen warriors to Valhalla. That's not what this is at all. This is aggressive. This is um, death dealing, death bringing, death prophesy. This is an it's 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 very much in that kind of darker battle worn battle wary war goddess energy completely and utterly and so it was really interesting to me that the perception the perception of valkyries is 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 one thing and even the mythology is supporting that it's something else And that's when it begins to get interesting to me because it showed an interlinking between Viking and Celt. You have this poem is said to be set in Ireland where the Vikings were invading Ireland in 1014. The influencing of each other's cultures is definitely there. You know, you have people who present this image like the Celts were insular and never dealt with anybody outside. And I've always strongly felt that the cultures of the Vikings and the ancient Celts bleed into each other in many, many ways. And battle and the presentation of battle and the divine influence of battle and the bloodthirstiness of spirits involved in battle is clearly at a parallel between these cultures. And Valkyries seemed to have this prophesy of death, which is very bave like very Morrigan-like uh, in many, many ways. So it's interesting to me that... Uh, you know, they, they, when they, the first poetry came through and it was all these voices, uh, the thudding of blackened wings foretelling death was a big energy that came forward. Um, the, the wings were not like shining white with shiny silver uh, She-Ra kind of headbands. That's not what I was getting at all. I was getting something much more primal, darker, uh, much more vicious, 
Nothing's so fragile, wingless, you'd make us, break us. Uh, and we're not having any of that. And I was like, okay, I'm on board now. Because <laughs> the energy of this is, is much more um, interesting to me. It's, it's, it's the cycles of battle and death and, and blood and gore and things. So I'm going to read to you um, a poem of the two armies from the Tyan Ten. Um, this is from the Kinsella translation. Uh, so you can see the similarities between this and the poetry that I read to you before. Ravens gnawing, men's neck, blood splurting in the fierce fray, hacked flesh, battle madness, blades in bodies, acts of war. After the cloaks, one's hero's heat. In man's shape, he shakes to pieces the men of Kroachach. With hacking blows, war is waged, each, tr each trampling, each hail Ulster, woe men of Ireland, woe to Ulster, hail men of Ireland. And then foretelling doom um, to the men of Ireland. And so it was really interesting to me that there were these energies that crossed over with war gods, particularly Morrigan and Bave, uh, with the Valkyrie, and Valkyrie being war maidens, maybe goddesses initially, um, maybe spirits attached to Odin and Freya, depending on the interpretation that were very much bound up with the energy of warfare, of, of warfare as it was. Um, and there was interesting parallels in several ways that cannot be denied. There was this idea of blood rain, raining blood down. Now, if, you know, in the first battle of Meg Tored, Morrigan and her sister conjures mist and showers of blood and fire down on the warriors of the Felbok to ensure the victory of the Tuatha Dé Danann. Uh, at that, that point, Morrigan is said to have been of Ireland already. She's already there. And it's a really interesting connection with the, the very imagery that can be seen with the raining of blood. There is an obvious correlation to fate within uh, battle with regards to prophecy and a destiny. There's a slightly different emphasis with the Valkyrie poetry having a leaning towards uh, looms and weaving um, and generally the Irish tradition is more about the spoken poem, the spoken prophecy that comes directly from Morrigan. This uh, is probably to do with the fact that um, there isn't a version to my knowledge of, of the Norns in the Celtic tradition. So the, the weavers um, in the Celtic tradition, uh, it's just don't, it, that's not kind of the same thing. There, there isn't that parallel there. That kind of fate is slightly different in the way that the, the peoples interacted with it. Um, that there, there still was fate and, and Geis and the, the broken word um, that you were, you had put into place and you were fated to perhaps break this Geis and, and then the, the gods would get involved to uh, see that it was done. But, the idea that of a fated outcome before the battle and put the power of poetry is present in both. There's, cl there's clear blood, gore, violence, uh, even enjoyment of carnage in both, but then they're battle cultures. So I'm guessing that perhaps it's not such a strange idea that peoples, even if they were different from different places in the same, around the same time periods who were engaging in warfare, um, were similarly minded about warfare, which was a, a truth of life back then. Um, with regards to Morrigan, you have sorrow heaps of um, gold, they've uh, presented as carnage within battlefields and stances. So it's really interesting to me that in the mythology even you have Valkyries influencing, participating in the outcome of battle, taking lives, um, and the fact that it was kind of up to them who lived or died in these battles, and that's a very organic trait in and of itself. So I think it's really interesting to see the crossover uh, between Valkyrie and, and organic energy here. 
uh, it's, it may also uh, be uh, slightly less crossover, at least in terms of mythology, but um, Valkyries being winged and, and, and with them having an association with Odin and Ravens, then perhaps the wings were black. Um, it's a looser idea. Uh, there is the connection there through carrion crows, ravens on the battlefield as a strong emblem, um, because obviously ravens and crows would have been present omnivores eating the dead on uh, on battlefields. So, so they would have been a physical image that could have stuck in the minds of people who were uh, presenting their mythology and, and presenting an image for their mythology. So I found it really interesting of these these themes, this this poetic tradition, um, the the carnage, the the bloodlust, the uh, there's kind of a uh, <sighs> judgment quality to uh, Valkyrie energy um, that mirrored a lot of the Morganic mythos really really strongly, and and even like key lines that even seem to bleed um, into. Uh, one another and other people have already in in certain places in history have already noted uh, the similarity um, to the two cultures it is worth saying that though the uh, saga the the battle of Plantav, some scholars have pointed out there are discrepancies between the poem and what is known of what actually happened and suggested that the poem was originally tied to the Battle of Confei in 1917, uh, it was a battle fought in Ireland between Norse invaders and the King of Leinster, or Gor Mac Ella, probably butchering that name as well. Uh, the Irish defeat led to the recapture of Dublin by the Norse dynasty that had been expelled from the city 15 years prior. Um, so it's but it is worth noting the interlinking of warfare uh, between the Vikings and the Celts. And this comes uh, hot on the heels of a really interesting post from Irish Central, which has a massive genetic study revealing that Irish have more Viking and Norman DNA than previously thought. So that can be found on irishcentral.com or i've shared it on starry eyed supplies uh, facebook page and i will read you a little bit which i think is was interesting because of the fact that it shows that borders aren't what people seem to think they are uh, researchers at trinity college dublin believe that viking and norman invasions of ireland have made a more striking impression on the dna breakup of the country than previously thought they have discovered 23 new genetic clusters in ireland not previously identified leading to the belief that we have more uh, viking and norman ancestry than previously evidenced Uh, which is to do with, you know, uh, intermingling uh, with marriage uh, as well as, as showing that the cultures interacted through war. By comparing a thousand Irish genomes with over 6,000 genomes from Britain and mainland Europe, genetic clusters within the West of Ireland in particular were discovered for the first time, leading the researchers to investigate if invasions from the Vikings and Normans to the East had influenced genetics. The genetics of the world's estimated 8 million people who claim Irish heritage could now be more complicated than previously believed but research such as this could go some way to identifying if there are any specific traits or illnesses that are linked to genetic clusters. Anyway this news didn't really um, shock me whatsoever it's always been something that history has, has been uh, fairly telling of which is the exploration the invasion the intermingling of peoples throughout history uh, people tend to have this idea of borders as if uh, we've at some point in history um, we were very very separate I feel like the opposite is probably true like depending how far back you go you have um, the land is all am amalgamation and people walked from one to the, the other and people settled in certain places and then the plates separated and we have 
you know, countries are separate now. Um, so initially there was a togetherness, the, the, the separation comes later. And once we have seafaring, invading, exploring people throughout history, I think that, to be honest, that is the breaking down of the idea that we all lived very closed off lives. It, to me, is another nail in the coffin of the idea that you have to have a uh, certain kind of ancestry to follow certain types of spiritual path. Ancestry is one of those strange, strange topics that comes up as a kind of uh, justification process within spirituality. Um, I've had an interesting journey uh, with ancestry of late, um, and it kind of seemed to climatize, I guess, no, accumulate, crescendo, into uh, this final kind of thinking about Valkyrie energy. This is kind of like the final step on that was to do with identity, as I mentioned, because they came at the tail end of lessons of identity. So it was really interesting. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, I had some information about two months ago, which I haven't really made a big deal out of because I didn't feel it really was a big deal. But it turns out my grandmother's father was Irish. He came over from Ireland and um, his entire bloodline from that point backwards is Irish, um, which I had suspected but didn't know for certain. And now I know for certain and it really doesn't make an iota bit of difference to me. Um, some people feel that you have to have it in order to uh, work within the Celts, but... I don't. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's secular thinking and it doesn't help anything, especially when we're trying to be expansive in terms of spirituality. So it's really interesting, though, that Valkyrie energy came at the tail end of all this identity because at, at the fore, you're thinking, well, it would, meet, it would be energies of, you know, it would be energies of battle, which it is. It would be energies of prophecy within battle which it is. It even has that kind of magic, blood, rain, mysticism around the idea of battle, which it does. Um, it has that interesting interconnection of peoples. That's true. That like the, the red lines of fate of people crossing over at different points in history, and then the creation of new bloodlines from these interactions, and the reshaping of the world and who rules and sovereignty because of these interactions. So it's very interesting in terms of uh, like a political stage and the pieces, chess pieces move around depending on invasion and battle and, and blood and prophecy and in the minds of the spirits and the gods with regards to these things, which it definitely does. It alters the course of destiny and fate. Definitely all these energies are definitely present within Valkyrie. And Valkyries have an authority though, which uh, I feel like, everything I've ever seen has kind of denied them a little bit. Like they're not servitors. From the energy that I have gotten, from the mythology that I have read, they seem to have chosen who would die that day. They did. They weren't just like servitors and, and messages service. They're not meals on wheels. I mean, it's a really strange kind of how they get put down, sanitized in a way. I do not guide. It li literally came up in the poetry when connecting with their energy. It's not about guiding. Um, it's about authority. Uh, they don't want to be demoted. You would demote us, sanitize us, saw down our vicious edges. We are the bone snapping, we are the bone jaw snapping closed. The heavy gurgle of man's last utterance. They are death. So that was really interesting. Um, and that kind of forces them to look at identity in different ways. So the Valkyrie energy is a much more aggressive, much more active, much more at the fore. And I think, again, it feeds into this energy that people just are afraid of death. And history, people kind of shy away and try to rose tinted glasses some of the violence of history, some of the blood, some of the gore, because war is now something that happens elsewhere in the world. We don't see it at we're not faced with it mostly and, and the only things we're faced with now are acts of terrorism or tragedy and people um, have some interesting coping mechanisms to cope with difficult 
times and i think this is part of what has become part of our identity we've become a little bit fragile in how we interact with the difficulties of life the real difficulties when we're faced with death when we're faced with blood when we're faced with gore when we're faced with pain when we're faced with life altering decisions that we don't want to make when we're faced with struggle and strife because all of these lessons come into a more organic practice and they definitely come into these energies of Valkyrie. When faced with recent energies to do with identity myself about who, who are you um, when you find that self under threat, you begin to realize that certain elements don't matter so much and it's more about an internal possession of authority and Valkyries have that authority. It's just that the world around them has kind of seemingly tried to sanitize them again into pretty shiny blonde maidens that lead the way to Valhalla. And that's true within energies of like, from when I found like Freya energies as well, kind of bloody vicious um, side. Sometimes people kind of make her all, you know, buxom and, and sensual because that's easier to digest somehow. But um, Freya's energies are very, very vocally aggressive on many occasions. She demands blood every time. So as does Morrigan. Um, and so that, that interconnectedness between war goddesses is, is interesting in terms of personal gnosis and the things that get presented within our path. And I think there is definitely an energy here of you need to trust your own inner sovereignty, your inner authority, and you need to get with the truths of life and stop pretending that things are less than they are things can be ugly and messy and chaotic and difficult and pull you to pieces left right and center but they can still be valuable and worthwhile and necessary and even beautiful in their in their macabre way stop trying to saw down your edges definitely that energy here um fate and death i mean things that cannot be changed um certainty is an interesting energy within valkyrie and within the identity because who you are is kind of certain you, you should be certain of yourself at the same time as knowing that you can evolve and change after a certain point you kind of know who you are is you're not in question you just kind of alter and change a little bit and grow a little bit and try and do better and try and elevate and try and ascend, but still at core, you know who you are in terms of identity. And I think the final thing that I'm going to uh, wrap up with this energy before I show uh, things is Valkyrie's reminders of our mortality. And people are afraid of that. Um, people are afraid of death it's a reminder of we are fragile we are blood bags pokers and we bleed so it's an interesting 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 lesson plan an interesting investigation into how people deal with death i think the study of death anatology and like how people deal with death is fascinating Throughout time, burials, traditions, mythology, I think it's all fascinating because it's ultimately one of those great unknowns. And how we interact with unknowns helps shape us. Right, so I'm going to show the little pieces now. So for anybody who doesn't mind about this bit, thank you for joining me. And for anybody who would like to see these little bits, I'm not going to be showing the spell oil I've had instructions so uh the lady who is has already seen the shots and she knows why to this energy so we'll start off with the realm candle and it's sigil which was channeled through the realm candles are designed to be meditational aid you're supposed to be able to light the candle use the sigil and focus and be transported to our realm so this is very much battlefield of the valkyrie we have this really beautiful color of 
kind of like an iron and we had that iron armor mentioned earlier and I had to remake it twice just to get the color that I wanted. Um, it's very much to do with blood on battlefield and you have a little sovereign twist with a little hint of gold, a little bit of that armor underneath. Um, and it kind of has that prophecy feel too, the prophecy of battlefields, that death, that Valkyrie beating wings, beating heart, beating, beating, beating. Um, it's, it's very kind of aggressive, but not in like a hostile way. It's just because it's a war field, it's a warfare energy. So um, it's very much about taking it to that place. Uh, the lady requested salt. So again, it has a, a battlefield energy. It's very uh, death and blood energies woven into it. So working with our Korean energy for me has that battle energy first and foremost, that death, that confrontation of self and sovereignty and purpose. It's kind of a, a pull yourself right up to your full font of your power energy. Very, very much so. And protection um, especially against malevolence in, in battle and things. This would be very for with the salt. Temple of the Valkyries. Hi. Oh. This is powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, again, it has a battle energy a little bit more of a woodland energy in just to weave in a little bit um a grounding within the temple so the temple of the valkyries doesn't necessarily have to be pure battlefield um we can take it into the woods in terms of woods to me might be a place of respite in between battles like cover so you're not going to get arrows in, in but you can use cover of trees you can rest you can, you can recoup you can ban yeah i'm getting images of like bandaging up your arms um and cleansing out wounds and preparing for the next battle listening to the next prophecy even giving the next prophecy speaking it battle magic before the battle that's what the temple of the valkyries is is the temple right on eve of battle the preparation, the leading up to oneself, the kind of like the brattle frenzy, to be sound of oneself, to be courageous, to put fear aside. The temple of the Valkyries about all of these things. And then we have the anointing oil, which I can show, which I... It may be... It may be one of my new favorite scents because it's light earthy, but then there's kind of like this spice... And it's like an earth spice. Um, so it's very much. It's in, it's in full possession of self. It's, it's very strong. It's very vigilant. It's very warrior-esque. And we now have the new starry-eyed surprise little fox stickers. You. So that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I got my points across. I've been kind of like in this really weird place with it because it's been like very like smoke and mirrors almost, like catching meanings, but knowing what you want. But it's been very interesting with Valkyrie energy. Very interesting. Anyway, that's it for this video. Before I go on for too long, uh, thank you guys for joining me and many blessings.